Good evening, church family. Thank you so much for tuning in with us this evening. And of course, tonight is our regular midweek service. And this is generally the time, if we were able to be meeting together, that we would have our prayer time and Bible study. And I want to encourage you to make sure that throughout the week you're taking time to head over to the church website and click on the tab that is labeled Prayer Wall. And there you will find an updated list of the church prayer needs. We are not able to do our prayer chain or bulletin like we normally would. And so the way that you can stay up to date with what requests are coming in is by going to the prayer wall. And then also the way that you can let us know of what prayer needs you have is by posting them on the prayer wall as well. So that's how you would find out who's asking for what in prayer. But that is also how you would let us know what you are asking prayer for. And uh, just click on the, on, the, uh, on the comment section there on the prayer wall. Type in your, your prayer request and then just uh, upload it. And that will right, be posted right to the wall. And uh, you can let your request be made known. And then let us heed the, um, the exhortation from James that we ought to be praying one for another. And that... We should certainly be praying for one another during times like we are living in with all of the fear, the the stress, the worry uh, surrounding sickness, health, COVID-19, shutdowns and and the like. And then we certainly need to be praying during times like this in our nation where there are rioting and unrest and contention and anger And we need to pray for wisdom and good discernment that we as God's people might be able to shine as lights in a crooked and perverse world. And in fact, I want to take this time to talk to you a little bit about what we're going to be doing this coming Sunday. We're going to be studying right through the book of Philippians. And actually, we're going to get right to that verse, that we should shine as lights in the midst of a crooked and perverse world. So what does it mean that the world is crooked and perverse? How do we see that in our day and age? And then what should our response as Christians be? We're going to tackle that subject On Sunday. And so if you want to be a part of that, you need to make sure that you go to the church website and you need to sign up to be a part of the Safe Assembly Services. There you can register and uh, you can tell us how many folks will be coming in your group so we can know how to plan and prepare uh, for the proper social distancing. And uh, let's, let's look forward to a great weekend where I'm sure we will grow, we will learn, and we will be edified and built up with God's Word for how we should respond, okay? So this evening, we're going to Psalm chapter 27. I want you to get your Bible out and I want you to turn with me to Psalm 27. We have been now for the last three months having services via technology, whether it be uh, YouTube, Facebook, or whatever other streaming service you might be watching this on. So we've had several months of this, and if we're not careful, we can kind of just fall into a routine that watching the midweek service is like uh, watching your favorite TV show or, or binging on your, ne- your, your Netflix uh, uh, show that you're in. And this is completely different. We're giving time to God's Word. And so I want you to make sure that you're getting God's Word op- open and out and that you're paying attention as we read through it. Psalm 27, and the title of the sermon is simply this, Sure Steps in Uncertain Times. Sure Steps in Uncertain Times. Every crisis brings with it a sense of uncertainty, a sense of anxiety. An international crisis brings with it a a heightened sense of anxiety. That's what we've been living these last several months. Our lives are not what they normally are. They're not what we're used to. We're thinking about people differently. We're looking at people differently. When we approach people, we approach them differently. We see our friends. We're, we're wondering, should I, should I shake their hand? Should I, should I give them a hug? Should I give them a holy kiss? Perhaps maybe a fist bump or a polite bow? When we see our friends that we haven't seen for weeks or perhaps months, we don't even really know how to approach them. When we're standing in line at the, at the grocery store, or, or, or waiting to get into a restaurant, we're always wondering, am I, am I far enough away from the person in front of me? 
Is the person behind me far enough away from me? And it has, all of this has us feeling very uncertain, very unsure. Uh, Amazon delivered a, a package to our house last week. And whenever Amazon delivers a package to our house, it's like Christmas morning. My kids go running to be the first one to get the package and be able to open it up. So my kids start tearing into this Amazon package. And as they do, Amanda comes around the corner and she says, Stop! Did you disinfect that package before you opened it? And who even knew that you're, you're supposed to disinfect Amazon packages now when you, when you receive them? And, and all of this uncertainty has us second-guessing ourselves like never before. That uncertainty has us second-guessing ourselves, which then leads us to this place of anxiety. Can I just tell you that it is quite normal and very natural to, to, to feel this way, to feel uncertain or afraid during times like this. However, I will tell you this, that we are not called to natural living. That as Christians, we are called to supernatural living. And that is why we go to the Scriptures. We go to the Scriptures because there is no better place to take our cues for living in this world than from the Word of God. So that's why we're turning our attention to Psalms 27. And Psalm 27 is written during a time of national crisis. You see that by the use of certain words in the text. Look at verse 2 where it says, wicked, enemies, foe. Look at verse 3, encamped. That literally means surrounded me. Or verse 3, war. Look down to verse 12. It says, false witnesses that breathe out cruelty. That word cruelty literally is insults or threats. So there's some kind of warfare that's going on in, in the time of the writing of Psalm 27. It's a time of national crisis, much of like what we're experiencing today. But it's also a time of personal crisis for the psalmist. The author of the psalm, none other than David. Right? So David has so many crises in his life, it's hard to actually pinpoint which crisis David is talking about here. I mean, you think of it. David was hated by his family. David was hunted by Saul. David was insulted by Goliath. David was attacked by the Philistines. There were several civil wars during David's reign. Even his own son Absalom led this, this insurrection against David. So which crisis is Psalms 27 talking about? It's almost like, take your pick. It could be one of a number of them. Psalm 27, however... It gives us an understanding of what the believer's mar life is to be marked with in time of crisis. That's why we've called it sure steps in uncertain times. Sure steps in uncertain times. I, I don't know what the times or the seasons look like, but I can be sure of the next step that I should take. Okay, so now this applies to many levels, many kinds of crisis in our lives. Certainly true nationally, but it's also true personally, relationally, financially, in your marriage, with your children, at your job, whatever it may be. Sure steps for uncertain times. Notice step number one. It's a step of vigilance. This is really found in verse number two and in verse number three. The Bible reads like this. When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat my flesh, they stumbled and fell. And though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. And though war should rise up against me, in this will I be confident. So notice it's a step of vigilance. Vigilance simply means aware or alert. David was aware of the threat that was going on around him. David was aware that the world that he lived in was full of wickedness, of wicked people. Of enemies. He lived in a dangerous world of which was always looking to be able to take advantage of David. We find ourselves here in the same kind of situation, do we not? That the world is a dangerous place. That the world is full of wickedness. That we have enemies in this world. That the enemies we have in this world, they are real. Why? Because there's a real evil in this world. And there are many reasons for why evil exists in the world. But hear me on this. There is 
one day, and I believe one day soon, that God is going to eradicate all the evil from this world. Jesus is coming back. You know, the apostles thought Jesus, the apostles wrote that they were living in the last days of Jesus returning. If the apostles were living in the last days, friend, well then you and I are living in the final few minutes. Now there are many reasons for why evil exists. But we cannot answer for why every evil thing happens. But what we can answer for is why there is evil. So we can't answer for why all evil things happen, but we can answer for why there is evil. And here's the Bible's answer for why there is evil in the world. And the answer is this. Evil is in the world because or as a result of sin. You see, sin broke the world and everything in it. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. So because of the rebellions of man's heart, all of the world has fallen into sin. According to Genesis chapter 3, Adam chose to disobey God. And as a result of Adam's disobedience, all of the world fell into sin. In fact, Paul says, for by one man sin entered into the world. And death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. You see, we live in a fallen world where there is violence and sickness and corruption and pain. These are the natural consequences for sin in this life. But our sin has more than natural consequences. Our sin has a spiritual consequence. And in fact, this is the bad news. Because the bad news is that the spiritual consequence of our sin is a separation from a holy and righteous God. But did you know there's actually worse news? The worst news is that there is nothing that you and I can do to fix the mess that our sin has made. For all have sinned, Paul says, and come short of the glory of God. In fact, even the good things we do, uh, the, the helping of the poor, the, the feeding of the hungry, the clothing of the needy, the going of the church, being moral and civil, even our righteousness, Isaiah says, is as filthy rags. That's the bad news, and that's the worst news. But here's the good news. The good news is that God sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross to pay for our sin. And Jesus rose from the dead in order to secure our justification. You see, the good news is that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But you know one of the best news? The best news is, is that if you run to Jesus Christ and if you believe on him, then you will be forgiven of all of your sin. You see, to believe on Jesus means to have life, have new life, and have eternal life. To believe on Jesus means to have hope and eternal hope. To, mean, to believe on Jesus means to have joy and peace and love and long-suffering and gentleness. And all the fruits of the Holy Spirit have come to bear in your heart because of your belief in Jesus. But listen, friend, don't miss it. In uncertain times, we need to be aware of our great need for God in this evil world. That's the step that David takes. It's a step of vigilance that there are enemies, foes, wicked people who have surrounded and have done war against him. We need to be, we need to take a step of vigilance. But notice, second, we need to take a step of confidence. This is really found in verse number one and in verse number three. The Bible reads, the Lord is my light. And my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? And though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. And though war should rise up against me, in this will I be confident. You see how David talks about fear and confidence in the same verse? He, he says there is fear, but I am confident. I'm not going to be afraid. Fear is the most common emotion during a time of crisis. And this is why soldiers and police officers and firefighters are trained to harness their fear. They're trained to take their fear and to channel it in order that they may fulfill the duty and the responsibility which is theirs. You see, David does the same thing. And David does the same thing, not in trying to simply channel his fear, but in thinking through the implications of who God is and just who is God. 
Well, David says, God is my light, my salvation, and my strength in verse number one. That God is my light, my salvation, and my strength. And so, because God is light, salvation, and strength, David says, I am not going to fear this world, but instead, I am going to fear God. And Solomon says, it's the fear of the Lord that is the beginning of wisdom. It is the fear of the Lord that instructs us and leads us into knowing what we ought to do next. Notice, notice David says, the Lord is my light. And I, I love the fact that David says, the Lord is my light. Because this is something that we all know about darkness. When it gets dark, when the shadows come out at night, it, man, we, the, the lights go off in the house. It's in the darkness that our fears normally are, 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 are increasing, right? We start imagining things in the dark. The, the fear accentu- or the darkness accentuates our fear. Well, whatever noise we hear in the dark, it's always something. It's always someone coming, coming to get us. And yet notice David says, the Lord is my light. I can live confidently in a dark world. Why? Because God is my light. And David also says, the Lord is my salvation, literally means my deliverer, that although there are those who are surrounding me and camping against me, waging war against me, the Lord is the one who will rescue me. And then David says, the Lord is my strength. And Paul says, similar idea about this idea, the Lord is my strength. The Lord is my strength. In order for the Lord to be our strength, we must recognize that we are weak. And that in our weakness,